This is a talk I gave in St. Joseph's Church in, in Sailor Town in Belfast on the Belfast Ranch 1935, and particularly the experience of violence of residents of Sailor Town itself. The 1935 rats are significant for later events because during 1969 they're constantly referenced as a parallel to what happened that year. Within two or three years of the Wall Street crash, Belfast had seen violence in 1932 with the outdoor relief rats, and then a railway strike again in 1933. And in the summer of 1934, again, there was further violence during that summer. The start of 1935 had been ominous, with trouble in April and May, including a brief curfew during a royal visit. An organisation that was heavily implicated in violent attacks um, was the Ulster Protestant League, and it also targeted communists and socialists as well as Catholic residents. By June that year, Areas like Dock Street and Ship Street had been the focus of attacks already. This is a district that in 1920 and 1922 had witnessed very significant violence. In fact, if you look at all the fatalities in Ireland during the War of Independence on up to about June 1922, somewhere between 20 and 25 percent of all those killed were actually killed in Belfast. And a significant number of those were killed in Sealer Town, York Street, North Queen Street, the Carrick Hill area, and the Bone, um, North Belfast. So the start, while the start of 1935 had been ominous, um, it didn't necessarily portend violence on the scale that had been seen then, but certainly based on previous years, there was the threat of significant loss of life and significant trouble. You can see here on a map that uh, the, the yellow area denotes the area that was curfewed in May in 1935. Um, it stretches from Frederick Street and Great Patrick Street across the Whitless Street and Broome Street and is bracketed roughly on sort of east and west by Corporation Street and Garmoyle Street and North Queen Street. Um, there's a darker outer line on the map and that's an area then that was subsequently curfewed in 1935 in July. While we, we have some record of individuals that were prosecuted during 1935, there is very little clear information on organisations and their role in any violence, particularly on the unionist side. Um, while the IRA itself was cautious about getting involved in direct conflict with the RUC and B specials, it actually had a training camp that it normally ran in County Louth at a place called Giles Key and nearby in O'Meath and it had run them there for two or three years and in the plan for 1935 had again been to stage a training camp that would coincide with the 12th holidays and um, when a lot of workers were typically off anyway so it wouldn't draw on attention for individual members to have gone off and gone to a training camp. As the summer approached and there was significant violence in Belfast already, in, obviously in smaller events, and I'll talk about some of them briefly in a few minutes, um, it put pressure on the IRA to make a decision about whether to retain most of its units in Belfast, because in previous year they had, been, had to be recalled over the 12th of July to, to place them around what are referred to as threatened districts, where there was an expectation there might be trouble. Um, and, and in those cases there was no trouble, partly because the IRA had brought units back to Belfast to, to deploy them in areas to prevent more trouble breaking out. So in 1935, when pressure was put on, the Belfast IRA still maintained that it would actually carry out its training camp as planned over that summer, rather than risk some sort of open conflict with the RUC and B-Special. Um, the, the shadowy Ulster Protestant League, we do know one or two individuals and claims that they have made at later dates. Um, a kind of notorious one is a guy called Alec Robinson who kind of entered a sort of slightly more benign mythology as Buck Alec because he, he walked around with a lion as a pet in later decades. 
but he has gone on record himself talking about his own role in the 1920s and by implication in 1935. Um, and this included carrying out attacks on individuals. Um, one very specific claim that he makes is about um, acting alone rather than acting with them, um, kind of other people assisting him because he didn't trust other people, but included uh, an, an t- at least one attack where he, he went in and he shot a woman in a house on her own. Um, and this is, I mean, we, we don't have any real idea of who directed Ulster Protestant League and its its actual role in violence itself, but um, but we have claims from likes of uh, Robinson about things that he did. So it gives us some idea that is consistent with all our kind of accounts that we have. And I'm going to refer to some of these as I go through the talk. One of the earliest events that attracted a lot of media coverage and attention was on the 16th of June, 1935. A girl called Annie Quinn left her house in Horning Street with her cousin Annie Lyons and they walked down along Earl Street to go to St Joseph's the 11 o'clock mass. At about 10.45, they passed a group of men sitting outside Daniel Boyle's bar at the corner of Earl Street and Nelson Street. The men jeered at them as they passed and when they'd gone about 30 metres past them, six shots were fired at them. The fourth of these wounded Quinn. Bridget Corr from Veer Street and her sister Josephine and another girl called Margaret Milligan were walking down the other side of the street and they witnessed the shooting. A man called Robert Lenehan was then arrested. Lenehan lived in Grove Street and you can see on the map here the proximity of all of these to each other. I mean, I think this is something that needs to be borne in mind when looking at the, the, this district and particularly Sealer Town, the York Street area and North Queen Street where little pockets of streets were not not completely segregated but had a uh, Maybe the, the balance of Catholics might live at one end of the street and the balance of Protestants at the other, just in terms of the portion of residence. And you needed to know the geography intimately because um, in times where there was you know, the threat of violence like this, simply being on the wrong side of the street, walking at the wrong, past the wrong street corner, um, taking deviating from uh, you know, what might be referred to as a safe route, could actually place you in jeopardy. O'Boyle's bar at the corner of Earth Street and Nelson Street you know, is a case in point. Down O'Boyle himself was shot dead several years beforehand during a series, a, a small episode of violence in which an RUC man was killed and O'Boyle was killed several days later. The backdrop to the July that year then was Robert Lenehan being arrested and charged with attempted murder. He denied involvement and his wife and other people gave him an alibi for the time of the shooting. And this led to protests when he was refused bail um, repeatedly at various hearings. And this included some prominent figures speaking out, asking why an individual like Lenehan with a uh, cast iron alibi from his wife and others was not being given bail. And on the 11th of July in particular, this was this came to head as he was then committed to stand trial later that year for the attempted murder of Annie, Annie Quinn. Of course, the 12th of July then, the next day, this was being widely reported in the press. So this presumably formed some of the atmosphere and tensions around the morning of the 12th of July in 1935. Later on that year, Lenehan actually pleaded guilty to wounding Annie Quinn with a revolver and he was given three months in prison. It's a relatively light sentence, as you can imagine. Um, the view and the image here is taken from, because so much of this district has been removed since then and flattened, um, it's not possible to retrace the route anymore. But you can actually stand at the point that Lenehan fired the shots from, which is roughly the very f- the foreground of this image. And if you can see the wooden pallets sort of in the centre of the screen, that's kind of the distance away the Quinn would have been from him when he fired. 
After the Annie Quinn shooting, the IRA started posting pickets, which were small units of five, six men armed with rifles in what they referred to as threatened districts. The Minister of Home Affairs and Unionist Government, Dawson Bates, under pressure because of the low level of violence and, and the increase in violence over the course of May, June, he, he was initially sought to ban all marches and demonstrations that summer, which would have included the Orange Order. But the Orange Order publicly rebuked Bates and more or less insisted that it was going to march regardless of whether it was a ban or not. Despite all this, the IRA, Belfast IRA still sent, spent most of his men at the uh, training camp in Giles Quay. And they would have been there over the 12th of July, so that would have avoided open conflict. But a unit from Bally McCart under Jack Brady remained at Belfast and it provided some level of cover to some of the areas over the 12th of July. Like so much of Belfast history, what actually happens on that 12th of July is heavily contested, um, particularly in contemporary newspaper accounts. Now, partly, this what's really just contested is who actually started the violence, because we know how the violence itself started. There was a clash of some sort outside this bar, Sheridan's, at the corner of Lancaster Street and York Street. This was in the evening as the Orange men were returning from their, their demonstrations that day. This is a photograph taken the next day of Sheridan showing the damage that was done to the bar. There was individuals outside the bar who were chased into the bar. Um, this prompted or precipitated a full-scale rat. Over the course of the day, Edward Willers died in, from gunshot wounds outside the bar and Margaret Emily Broderick died in another incident slightly further away. A number of individuals like John McKay and Thomas McDowell were also injured that day but they only succumbed to their wounds in later days, they didn't die immediately. The REC's initial response to the violence in Lancaster Street had been to bring out armoured cars and these were used to fire into Lancaster Street and Little Patrick Street. As crowd control weapons, um, they're not particularly subtle. This is a 1920 pattern Rolls-Royce chassis armour car with a .303 Vickers machine gun mounted in the turret and with radiator armour. This is the vehicle you can see here. The RUC had acquired six of these from the British Army in 1922 while the Free State Government had acquired 13, in, including the one known today as Leave the Man, which is kind of quite famous. On the likes of 12th of July, they, these were being used to fire bursts into residential areas. And of course, the Vickers, so, the Vickers machine gun isn't what you see depicted in kind of modern war films. I mean, these are really designed to, for plunging fire in the area rather than to fire against the individuals. So, I mean, the, you, you could argue that in terms of crowd control, you would open fire into what would be a, roughly a box that the machine gun aims at, intending to keep that free of people. But in a residential area, of course, that's, it's unlikely that it's not going to cause casualties. Can identify at least four of these armoured cars deployed in Belfast in July 1935 using basically using their registration numbers um, X13, 224, 3225, 226, 227. Three of them at least um, on the, shown on the images here can be seen in Earl Street, York Street areas and there's another one that was uh, in a photograph from Conway Street where a national school was burnt down over the course of the violence. If you look closely at some of these armoured cars, you can actually see clear damage, presumably from stones or other thing, other objects being thrown at them, thrown at them over the course of the trouble. These armoured cars weren't the only vehicles that uh, the RBC deployed as well, because looking at the photographs published in various newspapers over the, the following weeks, um, you can see crossly tenders. Lancia armoured cars as well, the kind of what are typically known as cage cars because of the 
the cage that's placed on the roof of them. And these are visible as crowd control and um, other vehicles um, that the RUC patrolled in, in the areas. There's an account of Ed Edward Willer's death in the newsletter in October 25th, 1935, um, Belfast Recorders Court. A Garvin McCullough said he and Willers ran to get past Lancaster Street when stones came over the roofs of the houses. Shots rang out and Willers and another companion ran on, and McCullough and another companion ran on, but looking back saw Willers lying on the street. The shots came from the direction of North Queen Street. Um, other accounts given are slightly more specific and suggest that the shots came from the eastern side of Lancaster Street. Um, it's possible that this specific this is meant to refer to something very specific or to certain residence houses in Lancaster Street. Um, a number of people note that they saw Wellers almost as if he was sitting off enjoying the sunshine that day on the footpath, but he'd actually been shot in the chest and was being attended to. Um, I'm kind of struck by the, the the young boy and the image of Sheridan's bar and his body language and facial expression in terms of what, how much of the violence that he actually saw that day, because his, his whole demeanour gives that, clearly gives that impression. The immediate aftermath of Wilder's death was that on, in Dock Street on the Saturday night, an accordion band paid a visit to his house, um, and the band, which was followed by a large crowd, carried a wreath to the house in mourning, and as they went, they played a funeral march, and after leaving the wreath at the house, they marched on playing the well-known hymn, Onward Christian Soldiers. This is from an account the Belfast Telegraph gave two or three days later. At North Ant Street, it's, the Belfast Telegraph says, as the band was passing into Earl Street and North Thomas Street, some provocation was offered the already highly strung crowd. This proved the match which set a section of the city ablaze with rat. Rushes were made for Catholic houses on one side and for Protestant houses on the other. Reverend Father McSparn of St Joseph's Chapel came out into the street and begged the police and armoured cars to do something. But the streets were crowded with women and children, between the police and the riders, and the guns could not be used with effect. The crowd went mad, and policemen had difficulty retaining their weapons, as infuriated men and women tried to grasp them. From behind a barrier of police, men drew revolvers and fired at their opponents. Meanwhile, flames lighted the scene, and one without parallel in civilization, and belonged to some creation illustrative of Dante's Inferno. I'm constantly struck in accounts and, and images from the rats of the presence of children and the references to children being present and witnessing all the events. Because I think this provides the direct link with 1969 and with the telling of the stories about 1935 and that period in between because the folklore and the oral history of the events of 1935 presumably provide people with the memories and the accounts of what happened and we see this clearly reflected in how they effectively reenact a lot of the events in 1969 and I presume and I don't think it's wrong to assume that the children provide that very physical link between the two sets of events. The other fatality on 12th July itself that occurred in Main Street um, is recounted by Samuel Broderick, again in the Belfast newsletter, but this was in the 23rd of July 1935, um, and given it evidence to the coroner. He told how he and his wife, Margaret Emily Broderick, and their child were going to visit his brother, who lived in the New Lodge, at 7.30pm. As they left the house, their house in Marine Street, um, shots were fired from Little Ship Street, and he told the inquest that Margaret Emily said, Sammy, I am shot. When two other men came to try and assist her and, Sa and Samuel Broderick, shots were fired at them as well, but they managed to move her around the corner. 
She was brought to the matter where she died at 8 p.m. And here's another account from the Belfast Telegraph's kind of recounting of the events of the weekend. And again, this gives an idea of some of the behaviour crowds on the Saturday night. While flames roared, rifles cracked and people yelled and cursed and sprang at each other like maddened animals. In the midst of it came the clang of the fire brigade engines and the strange psychology of the crowd could be seen in the calmness with which they watched the firefighters set to work. People fled from their homes as if from a plague and in their numbers were Catholic and Protestant alike. The police charged time and again with batons. Armoured cars diced from point to point and volleys were fired in the air to drive the rattlers to cover but with only temporary effect. The district, composed in the main of a mass of small streets, intersecting each other at frequent intervals, enabled the mobs to disperse and reassemble at will and no sooner was one rat broken up than another had started elsewhere. The reference to the use of rifles here is quite interesting because one of the key obsessions of the Belfast IRA, particularly in the aftermath of the riots of 1935, was increasing its availability of rifles as armaments. Rifles seemingly in 1920 and 1922 had been very effective at keeping mobs at bay and at pushing back potential attackers from threatened areas. So in the aftermath of 1935, July, rats, and that summer really, it began to pursue attempts to acquire more rifles. Another attack that occurred over that weekend, and again, that it's, it, it should be noted the attacks on individuals that are hidden within the overall rats, um, this is one where Teresa Johnson from Fleet Street was attacked in her own home. And this recalls the claims of the likes of Alec Robinson of going in and attacking lone women in the house. Now, Teresa Johnson wasn't alone at home, but the, it's notable the number of women that are injured and that are attacked over the course of it, and particularly targeted as individuals rather than groups of people in the midst of a, a, a larger rat getting injured. I mean, I think it's not... Th th these are people who are, or women who are being specifically targeted. Teresa Johnson's account goes as follows. And this is again given in the Belfast newsletter on, on the 3rd of October, 1935. When her sister came into her house by the back shouting, here, they com here they're coming, there was a mob, and a man, producing a revolver, shot her in the chest. She ran into the kitchen and collapsed. She did not know why she should be shot at, and the crowd could have gone to anybody's door as well as hers. Teresa Johnston was lucky though. The bullet passed through her chest and exited the back. Lucky, of course, is a relative term. She lost an awful lot of blood, but she did survive. While there's a lot of evidence sectarian violence and violence against individuals, also, as any violent event tends to happen, it was accompanied by others opportunistically taking advantage of, of the trouble. A mob attacked McQuaid's public house in Earth Street about noon on Sunday, and this is another Belfast Telegraph account after the weekend. It states, they smashed in the doors and were supplying themselves with liquid refreshment when police and military turned up and put them to flight. The stock of barrels in the public house were loaded upon a police tender and provided a strange sight passing along Royal Avenue on Sunday afternoon. Smith's Trafalgar Bar in Trafalgar Street was loaded during the afternoon. The mob dispersed for a time but later turned up in force in North Ann Street, where they set fire to two houses. Soldiers extinguished the flames in one, but the brigade had to be called to the other. A 75-year-old woman named Ellen Connor of 55 Fear Street, 
who was shot on the Saturday, was stated to have improved at the matter that morning. And the brulet that had bra- grazed her brain, and she had a marvellous had, had a marvellous escape from sudden death. It's interesting that the Telegraph appends that comment about Ellen Connor to the account of the drunken rioters, but clearly, as with a lot of the other attacks, um, there certainly is a trend where women seem to have been deliberately targeted. In another case, on the Saturday night, a bomb was flung into the house of a Mrs Heatley in Dock Street, and much damage was caused to the parlour, but no one was injured. I'll come back to Mrs Heatley again in a few minutes. The casualty lists were published for the various days and it's interesting to note the number of people that are injured with uh, lower body bullet wounds which presumably either comes from some of the armoured cars firing into the roads or from the apparently ubiquitous revolvers that were being fired. And hidden within that as well, you can see uh, a lot of references to individuals being hit with stones and with other implements. Um, This includes people like Mary Long from Hanover Street, who was in the matter, detained in the matter hospital with kicks to the arm and abdomen. Um, The George Andrews, 48, of Eglinton Eglinton Street, with a wound over the eye caused by a kick. Others with abrasions to the face, stone wound to the side, wounds to the hand, wounds to the hand by stone. A John O'Hanlon from Leper Street um, was in the Matter Hospital with incised scalp wounds. Others had abrasions to the leg, back and stomach, wounds, stone wounds to the face. And of course, there were of course people injured in the chest. And in quite a, a number of RUC men were also inj- injured by bullets. Uh, Head Constable Emerson from Glen, Glen Ravel Street uh, was shot in the thigh. And uh, other policemen, including Constable Harrison, injured by a stone, and a Constable McMullen with gunshot wounds to the chest. These are only the, the injured from the 12th of July itself. We can see from the fire brigade reports the pattern of some of the violence as well. On the Saturday night, the fire brigade were called out to Erd Street at 9.13pm, the two houses. Then again to North Ann Street at 9.25pm, the number of houses. And at 9.44pm to the Little York Street, Trafalgar Street Junction, where a pub and three houses had been put in fire. The the next, after midnight on the Sunday morning at 1.39am, they were again called to North Ann Street, and then again at 1.46pm that afternoon. They were called to Sandy Row that afternoon as well, and back to to North Ann Street on a number of occasions, and North Thomas Street, and Apsley Street. These photographs show RUC on guard at the corner of North Ann Street, and in the other photograph, a number of the children playing in the ruins of one of the houses that were burnt out in North Dan Street and you can see the presumably some of the belongings and possessions of of the occupants of the houses that had been pulled out to the road and set on fire. Again, note the presence of the children here um, witnessing the aftermath of this and presumably witnessing some of it as it happened. We're lucky in the Associated Press, um, uh, like Getty Images, and some of the newspapers did publish a whole series of photographs. Um, I just included some of them here. This is an Associated Press photograph taken by Sid Beadle of uh, Crossley Tender, and you can see in front of it a Lancia cage car uh, passing along York Street and Lancaster Street Junction. Um, you can see in the background there the Sheridan's Bar, the Ostrich, um, with what looks like a pallet that's been used to cover up the window. This photograph's obviously taken after the photograph of the young boy standing outside the bar when it had been wrecked. Um, other photographs that are, are show the soldiers that were deployed on the evening of the 12th of July and for a period of time afterwards. This shows the so- soldiers that were deployed 
at the corner of Little Patrick Street and Little York Street. Um, and there's uh, two or three photographs of these which appear to be roughly in sequence when the soldiers first appear and some of the residents come out to meet them. Um, and you can see um, th these, these are Getty images, but you can see that this young boy in the foreground and the photographer notes the, the aggression being shown to the boy by the boy to him and the boy's body language, which he kind of captured in the photograph. And again, I wonder how much of this we are seeing is due to what these children have witnessed over the previous few days. Um, you can see the residents walking on down the little York Street here. Remember, f quite far down the street, towards the further end of Trafalgar Street, uh, there's a number of houses that had been burnt out. You can see the remains on the middle of the little Patrick Street here of a barricade or of something that's been burnt. Um, this is one of the streets in which it's noted that the armoured cars fired bullets down the street. Um, these are these are soldiers of the border regiment that were deployed on the 12th of July. And this is one more photograph just showing that close up again of the the barricade and or whatever had or not barricade, sorry, whatever had been burnt in the middle of the road. And you can see the soldiers uh, with bayonets fixed um, as they're deployed on each of the streets. These photographs provide the image that population in Britain would have got of what had happened, judging again, ju judging by the press reports and the photographs that appeared in the press. This is a photograph the, the Scotman sh Scotsman showed on the 19th of July and it's kind of roundup low week, which shows soldiers taking a break outside. Uh, I don't think it's Sheridan's, but it appears to be another bar um, along York Street somewhere. This is another photograph that appeared, this is one in the London Illustrated News on the 20th of July. And it shows uh, soldiers walking down along Little York Street past some of the houses that were burnt out. This is at the other end from the photograph that I'd showed earlier. So this may well be some of the same detachment of soldiers. An Irish press of the account of the trouble noted that the storm centre line between George's Street and Whitless Street on the dock side of York Street is an armed camp. Soldiers in full war kit patrolling it in platoons. And this photograph clearly illustrates that. But if you note particularly the house with the scorch marks, the burnt houses at the very forefront of the image, and the scorch marks above the door shows that this, uh, this house um, appears in other photographs later on. Uh, a photograph that appeared in the Irish Independent claimed to show Catholic homes on fire in the Little York Street. Um, this is the grainy image here, and this appears to be the same episode that led to these houses being burnt out. This photograph, show, if you look at the scorch marks that I noted, this is the, clearly the same houses in Little York Street. Mrs Heatley in Dock Street that was mentioned that had her house burnt out. Um, there was an account given it in the 15th of July in the Irish press. It described how a vivid description of the bombing of her home on Saturday night was given by Mrs Ellen Heatley to our reporter. A crowd of about 100, she said, gathered round the house and a bomb was thrown through the parlour window. It exploded with terrific noise, blew a large hole in the floor and wrecked walls and the furniture. Ten or twelve men entered the house and proceeded to wreck everything in it. Her four children were in the house, as also was an 81 years old man and a grand aunt of Mrs Heatley's. Now, obviously, her own children witnessed all these events, um, as presumably in other houses, and in at least one other account, I want to give uh, how children were in the house where the house was attacked. But whether how much these children in the picture witnessed all of this or witnessed the aftermath. Again, think, thinking forward to 1969, you know, there is, there's obviously a significant link between the individuals here, what they saw and what happens later. And as you can see, this is a close up of some of the images. Um, these are the kids learn, look, obviously very well dressed, for the day and 
it's just interesting to wonder how much they, they would have seen and how much they will relate to their own children later on. Other general photographs, just to kind of round out some of the images from the, the weekend's rioting, show this is York Street with the uh, REC and British Army patrols going down York Street and you can see some of the army vehicles in the background there. And here at Earth Street in the corner of York Street showing REC um, armoured car in the centre of the image there and the REC patrol um, outside public house here at the corner of Earth Street as well. When the general street violence of the weekend calmed down, like further fatalities still followed. Um, and what one of, I think that some of this is linked to the events then in Louth where the IRA were holding a training camp. On the morning of the 13th of July, the IRA camp was raided by a large party of Guardi, and this included what were called the Broy Harriers, which were the political police of the Guardi. They confiscate all the weapons in the camp and bring at least 13 men to Dundalk uh, police station where they're charged. There, there's a lot of animosity over what's happening because the night of the 12th of July, the residents in Lancaster Street had sent word across to Bally McCart, to the IRA commander there, Jack Brady, that there was serious trouble and he sends over a detachment that sets up a command post in Trainer's Yard in Lancaster Street and what IRA men are available then try and provide some sort of cover to some of the areas. Bobby Hicks was delegated to cycle down to, to Giles Key and he arrived later that evening and advised them what had happened. Um, and the decision was taken by the kind of IRA staff, battalion staff that were present, that they would return to Belfast the next morning. They would leave at 6 a.m. and they would cycle back up. Certainly over the course of the 13th, judging by some anecdotal accounts that are left by IRA volunteers that were active, um, they talk about being deployed to, with rifles to fire down sh the streets and to fire at crowds. And there's a number of instances where there are fatalities which may well be reflect some of that activity. William Little, aged 23, of Collier Street, was shot on the 13th of July in New Dock Street. Um, Daniel English and Andrew, uh, from Andrew Street recalled that on the th at 9.30 on the 13th of July, he and Little um, had were making arrangements about taking their families to Whitehead for a holiday. And after they'd been made, Little left to go home, and he was only a few paces up Dock Street when a number of shots rang out from Garmoil Street and he was hit. English helped to drag Little into a house in Garmoil Street, um, and he said he saw a number of men running down New Dock Street but couldn't recognise any of them. The funerals of those killed over the 12th of July and the succeeding days became the focus of further trouble. On the 16th of July, there were a number of incidents that arose from funerals and we, get, we have one or two photographs which are the only real photographs of actual trouble taking place, one of which is at the corner of York Street and Donegal Street, where William Little's funeral, when it reached it, there was a gunshot heard. Um, the crowd tried and get into the International Bar and there are there's significant trouble inside the International Bar itself. And we have another photograph that shows the RUC going to deploy in into York Street from Donegal Street. And it's quite interesting because if you look at the photograph, on the right hand side people are looking one direction, um, the police are looking another, some people are looking at the police, some people are looking inside the International Bar, and clearly it's very confused what's going on and this is the, what happens immediately afterwards is that uh, there, and you can see the hand injuries from the hand-to-hand -hand fighting 
which followed it again in the accounts from the Casalitas in hospital, where you have the likes of Jared Kelly injured with injuries to the face by kicking, Charles O'Neill injured to eye and chin by kicking, others injured to hand and foot by bottle. But in the immediate in the immediate minutes after the trouble inside the International Bar on the corner of York Street, the crowd move into Academy Street, just then behind it, and there's an account given on the 11th of November, on the 1st of November, 1935, which describes the mob violence and what is described by the deputy recorder of Belfast as the worst case, and oddly one that seems to be overlooked in practically all the accounts of the violence of 1935. And the photograph here shows one of the wrecked homes in Academy Street. This is the account given in the newsletter. Mrs Roseanne Walsh claimed compensation for herself and her infant daughter as the result of a disturbance in Academy Street on 16th of July. Mrs Walsh resided at number 19 Academy Street along with another lodger, Mrs Margaret Partington, who also claimed compensation. Mr P. A. Maranen instructed by Brian, Mr. Brian Cosgrove, appeared for the applicants. Mr. Marinan said that of all the things that occurred in Belfast, the facts connected with the present case were probably the worst. The climax of the attack on Academy Street led to a most terrible tragedy. One of Mrs. Walsh's three children, who was aged two, died as a result, he submitted, of the knocking about and trouble that the family sustained. It appeared that the funeral of one of the victims of the rats was in progress along York Street and was entering the junction of Royal Avenue and Donegal Street when there was a panic among the crowd following the firing of a shot. The crowd broke into Academy Street, which was off Donegal Street, and they entered the house of Mrs Walsh, who had had a baby only two days before, and of Mrs Parrington, who had children aged three and five years. The crowd appeared to have armed themselves with fire raising material for they threw paraffin about and set fire to the house. The applicants with their children ran upstairs. Mrs Walsh returned downstairs and realising the danger she was in from fire and the crowd set upon her and threw her into the street. She was only saved by the arrival of police and soldiers. Mrs Partington endeavoured to escape by the back of the house from an upstairs window by lowering her, lowering her children out and jumping herself. Mrs Walsh had to go to the Union and Mrs Parnington, who was the wife of an English sex serviceman, after treatment went to Dublin, where she was attended at St Stephen's Hospital. Mrs Walsh later got shelter in an old empty house and there her child of two years died from the shock. The other children suffered from debility and inflammation from the suffering which the mother endured. Mrs Walsh herself was still in a dangerous state of health. On Mrs Walsh being called and stating that her age was 22, Mr J Craig for Belfast Corporation said Council's story was substantially correct and the evidence could be confined to the question of damage. Mrs Walsh said she had three children at the time of the occurrence, Catherine being only two days old, Catherine was still in bad health as a result of Witness's condition. Joseph, her second boy, died mainly from the knocking about that he received. Mrs Partington said she was lodging with her husband in Academy Street. And when the fire was started in the kitchen, she ran upstairs. She lowered the children from a window three storeys high onto a scullery roof and jumped out herself. They went to the Matter Hospital and later to Dublin. She had not yet recovered her usual health. After medical evidence, including that of Colonel Mitchell, who said that while Mrs Walsh bore no marks, she had evidently come through a very tragic time. Judgment was reserved in the case. Joseph Walsh's death is recorded on the 5th of September, 1935. His name doesn't typically feature in any account of the events that year, but Belfast Corporation didn't even contest that his death was a result of the events in Academy Street on the 16th of July. These type of events continued sporadically 
over the course of August and into September. Um, there were a number of further funerals after individuals died from their wounds, but the main fatalities that occurred were another small group which occurred in September when following a band march in Greencastle. Uh, there was a shooting and a member of the band was killed and subsequently a publican was shot dead in Erd Street which was claimed to be a direct reprisal for it. And over the same weekend, and as a kind of backdrop to that weekend, two 17-year-olds in the shipyards were playing with a revolver, which clearly they was intended for use, it was illegally held. And one of them discharged the revolver and killed the other. And I think it's another fatality should, that should be considered as part of the group for over the course of that summer. And again, it provides significant context to the events of that weekend in September. Now, there is one small, I think, um, uplifting story that can be added to the end of all of this. One of the main things that happened over the course of that week, and again, if you consider all the parallels of 1969 in terms of the forms of violence, um, the events that occurred after 1969 with a lot of the, the fatalities that occurred, including attacks on individuals, that uh, the peace lines were also erected in 1935. But it's notable for a reason that, that the residents immediately identified what's problematic with them. There is a photograph of a barricade being erected across the threatened area. Or, you know, this phrase that's used, threatened areas. Um, you can see, and I, I think, I'm pretty sure this is Dock Street, because you can see there's a the symbol for a pawnbroker shop in the top right-hand corner. So we're looking across Nelson Street at Dock Street here. And the streets that had um, barricades erected across them were all up at that end of Nelson Street and Sailor Town. Like New Andrew Street, New Dock Street, Marine Street, Ship Street, Fleet and Fleet Street. But the residents actually didn't welcome the barriers being erected. And there's a, a series of accounts of the violence of 19, the 1930s were gathered by Ronnie Monk and Bill Rolston and published in a book called Belfast in the 30s in Oral History. And they mentioned the fact that Jackie Quinn claimed that nobody in the area really welcomed the barricades. And though they may have publicly presented as a way to keep people out of the area, the barricades actually had the effect of making residents feel even more confined and under siege. And this is kind of an interesting point to maybe demonstrate some of the things that were forgotten about the trouble in 1935, that, um, that uh, there was a potential lesson there that was overlooked, that possibly erected barriers actually you know, perpetuated and heightened a sense of tension and division rather than actually um, resolved any of it. But, uh, but that was the content of the talk that was given in St. Joseph's um, on the 8th of December this year, 2018.